I'm Betty Johnson, Assistant Dean for Faculty and Staff Diversity, Development and Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where we are committed to solving serious health and social problems facing the world. Our success in addressing these issues has huge implications for the future. No factor is more important to this pursuit than outstanding leaders. Therefore, the goal of Voices in Leadership is to highlight the experiences of those confronting these major challenges and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can affect change. We believe these lessons and insights should be shared widely and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and welcome to Voices in Leadership. I'm Eric Anderson, the Deputy Director of this program, and I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished guest today. This series discusses the characteristics that make a great leader, and Dr. Soraya DeLille exemplifies all of them. She began studying general medicine at Kabul Medical University, pursuing her education and career, and she remained undeterred when the hospital she worked in was destroyed. Later, the young mother of two made the momentous decision to travel to Boston from Kabul as a Harvard President Scholar and graduated from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health with a master's in public health. Dr. DeLille has worked with UNICEF, the International Organization for Migration, and Doctors Without Borders. From 2010 to 2014, she was the Minister of Public Health for Afghanistan and is now the Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations in Geneva and the Ambassador to Switzerland. This fall, she is also serving as a Menschel Senior Leadership Fellow here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. We're delighted to welcome Dr. DeLille back to Longwood to celebrate her indomitable spirit and her inspiring leadership. In spite of seemingly impossible barriers, Dr. DeLille has achieved success not only in medicine, but has become a stalwart champion of global health and public service, and is a bright example to our students who will follow in her footsteps. Before I turn the session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Sue Goldie, the, the Roger Irving Lee Professor of Public Health. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Soraya DeLille to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome everyone, and in particular, I would like to extend a warm welcome to my colleague, friend, and role model, Dr. DeLille. Um, thank you, for everyone, for joining us. So uh, Dr. DeLille, um, you and I have had a chance to talk a little bit, and I think there's many, many things we could talk about, but above all, I'd like to ask you to reflect a little bit on your journey to get us started. You are a physician. You're a public health um, researcher, you're a public health practitioner, you're a policymaker, and you are a leader. And what I'd like to have you do is maybe reflect and take us a little bit on the early part of your journey and, um, and share some of, the, some of the twists and turns that happened to sort of shape what some of those next steps were that landed you in the ministry. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm honored to be here among you. I was born and grown up in Kabul. My parents were teachers, and they had higher education with degrees from overseas. I had a happy childhood, had access to public kindergarten, to public school, and the school I went to had boys and girls together, primary school, and we had, in addition to the subjects we used to learn, we also had art and music and sport and of course, access to facilities like library and a uh, sport field. That was not the only school. There was a couple of schools, several schools like that, public, uh, av publicly available in Kabul and in major cities in Afghanistan. In 1960s and 1970s, Afghanistan started its move toward a liberal lifestyle. Women had access to university level education to professional career, to public transport, and to public space. My, my mother in 1960s used to ride bicycle commuting from house to her school. That was the time when burqa became optional for women in Afghanistan. And that was the time when there was a mood of tolerance and openness. Uh, as the country started its first steps toward democracy. My entire education was in Afghanistan was through the public system. Later on in my life, I realized 
that affected my my beliefs and and, and my aspirations. Uh, I realized how much important it is to have access to public services, good governance, and peace. Afghanistan was relatively in a peaceful era in, in, in that time. Later on for my profession, I chose to become surgeon, and I went to medical school in Kabul. I worked very hard, and, and I graduated, and straightforward, I went to residency and surgery program. I had a very clear uh, roadmap for my career that I will become surgeon in certain certain time or year, and then I will become a lecturer and I will be a, a surgeon in one of the hospitals in Kabul, a good hospital in Kabul, and that was that seemed enough for me, and I couldn't imagine more than that at that time. However, it didn't work like that. Kabul started to to became place of fighting. Uh, this is 1992. The hospital I was working in was damaged and destroyed. Uh, my father was injured in a rocket attack, and my uncle was killed. And Kabul became the front line uh, of different uh, factions fighting uh, between each other. Uh, there was a lot of rocket shillings, rocket attacks, civilian casualties, destruction, and so on. So we left our family house, our family apartment, and we went to the north of Afghanistan, and that's where I joined uh, IOM and later on Mids and Sons Frontiers for a short while, and UNICEF. Uh, the lessons I learned from those years that, yes, things may not work in, in the way that I planned for it. Uh, I also uh, understand that we should not take those things for granted in life. Uh, we should be open for opportunities. We should learn from the hardship, and we should continue. Did it hurt me? Yes. Did it stop me from moving forward and exploring new opportunities? No. Um, I later on joined UNICEF, and UNICEF was a great organization to work with in a country like Afghanistan. In UNICEF, I went to a graveyard three hours away from the center of the province. And I saw a graveyard called measles. And this was hundreds of children who were killed from measles within a few weeks in one winter season. I was thought measles is contagious. I was thought measles is very dangerous. It could kill. It could cause disability. It could lead to malnutrition. But I never taught in medical school how to prevent it. I never taught in medical school that there is vaccination for that, which is cheap relatively. It, it, it costs only a few uh, dollars, less than $10, to reach a child in a remote uh, uh, place in a developing country. I started to, to question serious issues from myself, asking how health priorities are set in the country and how those interventions, which seemingly uh, look uh, not very important, make an impact on life and on well-being of children and families. So that uh, shaped, later on, shaped my, also my, my, my core principles in terms of child vaccination, in terms of saving lives in terms of saving and uh, setting priorities that make sense to the context. In UNICEF, I also saw the linkages uh, between uh, girl, girls' education and maternal health outcomes, between food security and child uh, survival, between child survival and child development. It also helped me to look at programs and policies from child's right perspective from a human right perspective, and to understand that every child has an equal right and no child should be left behind. What's remarkable when uh, you dive into that path prior to the ministry, so um, you know I jokingly divide your life into phase one, zero to 15 years old, phase two, <laughs> the next 20, just to kind of wrap my head around all you've done. And the fabric of all of the different health conditions that you have uh, worked for, the different ways you've thought and have been in the field working from the health sector and from outside the health sector, um, it's, 
you, you came to the ministry with a rich, sort of um, diverse portfolio. I have a, a personal question, though, and since we're on camera, you, you're kind of stuck trying to answer it. Uh, but, you know, why didn't you leave? What, you, you were really determined, you were gonna be a surgeon, you were on your path, um, you had the ability and the connections to be able to maybe go to school elsewhere and stay there. Um, why did you stay year after year, job after job, position after position? Um, and I'm gonna leave that open. Two reasons for that. Thank you for asking me that question. I never ask this question in public. One, deep down, I had a sense and a strong feeling that if I leave the country, somehow down the road, I will feel incomplete and I will feel unfulfilled. And that was not easy. I knew that I would have a good life and, and so on, but that feeling of unfulfillment bother, bothered me and, 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 and helped me to stick. Second, I firmly believe that Afghanistan should be built by Afghans. There is no option. Afghanistan has challenges. It, we have faced hard times, but we have also faced good times. We have also seen very good times, promising times, happy times, joyful times. So it will come back again, and it's for us to stay committed for the cause of the country and, and be optimistic and, and give it back to the country. I love the country, and, and uh, I wish that I gave back what it gave to me at the time that I needed the most. Did anyone you work with ever fear that you were gonna leave? Were you ever confronted with that? Abandon the cause? I have seen, when we graduated, we were 400 students. This is 1991 class of Kabul Medical School. Many of them left the country, and I don't uh, blame them. They are in North America, they are in Europe, they are in Australia and everywhere. Some established a very successful career for themselves. I hope one day they come back and they contribute to the country in a meaningful way. Uh, but I believe leaving the country is not an option. So let me, uh, turning back to the country and your commitment and my phase three of your life, so I've simplified it, um, the roots of your leadership and all the attributes we all think of of leadership happened from the moment you left medical school. They happened in that year the hospital uh, was destroyed and you elected to make all of the decisions you did. But you arrived um, not in a simple situation. And uh, I call this the phase of five years because it's kind of five years. And what I, I had hoped is to ask you to reflect a little bit on that period where you really took a leadership role. And while there is plenty of areas that I could, and if we had a lot of time, I would love to ask you about areas of your expertise, um, how to reach rural communities with health, how you scale up a uh, health workforce, global governance, development assistance. I don't wanna ask about that. I, I want you to, if you wouldn't mind, share with us um, some of what the, the tough decision making, what, what was life like? And what did you have to draw in yourself to get through things? And, and maybe an example or two to give our students and others a flavor of uh, what you went through. Being a minister of public health in Afghanistan is tough. It's, it, it's very challenging. At the same time, it's also rewarding, especially if you look at it backward. It's tough because there's a lot of expectations whether on curative medicine, on preventive medicine, on, on pharmaceuticals, on human resources, on medical education, on postgraduate training, on referral system, rural, rural health system, urban health, etc. So it's, it's, it's also very wide and very, very multidisciplinary in, 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 in uh, some ways. As a minister, I have to deal with uh, multiple stakeholders. 
and many of them didn't know health. I have to deal with parliamentarians, lawmakers and legislative uh, body of the government. I have to deal with the ministers, especially Minister of Finance, for fiscal uh, resources, for annual budgets. Um, I have to deal with other ministry lines like Ministry of Justice for regulations and, and, and laws and Ministry of Women Affairs, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Rural Development, and also Ministry of Interior and Defense who deals with security. Uh, I will tell you why I, I have to, to work with those ministries also. And then, of course, with, with the Office of President, with, with media, we have got a freedom of speech in Afghanistan, and we have a lot of media um, networks in the country. And then with the public, with the civil society, with non-governmental organizations, with the staff and the ministry. So it was a, a wide, a very diverse group of stakeholders that you have to deal with. And you, I, I need, I should say that, you have to have very good communication skills, and you have to know what to be said, where, and how. For example, when, when I, 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 I learned this, by the way, I learned this through those five years. When you speak with the Ministry of Finance, you don't speak about maternal mortality, or if you say maternal mortality ratio, or you speak about productivity, you speak about uh, work created by doing this job, uh, you, you speak about the revenues that will come to the system, whether they are indirect revenues. Uh, you speak about savings that you are going to make. When you speak about parliamentarian, uh, then it's a totally different scenario. Then you have to speak, you have to convince them on, on why we don't need a health clinic in every district. Why we, we, it's better to, for example, invest on roads, on, on, on schools, on, on education, rather than having clinic and health centers in, in, in every village and in every district. And why, for example, maternal nutrition is important, why nutrition in general is important, and, and all of these things. Health is, is very multi-sectoral, and there is lots of things outside health that impact health and impact the performance of the Ministry of Health, uh, which, which is very important for this audience to, to know about it, uh, because you will, in the real life, you will face that. Uh, so I, I, let me tell you a number of things. When, when I went to the ministry, first of all, let me tell you that during Taliban time in the late 90s, I was a physician, and I couldn't enter that ministry because of one biological characteristics, because I am created woman. And just for that fact, I was, I was not able to enter even the premises of the ministry. And then 12 years down the line, I was in charge of that ministry. So when I went to the office, I knew that my success or my failure will not be individual. It will have an impact on decisions that girls and women and the new generation and young generation of Afghanistan will be making for themselves. So that's why I took it very seriously. Uh, I, with that grounding principles, without se with that sense of responsibility and service, I also, I was very lucky to have a supportive husband. We have three children, and my husband took care of a lot of household responsibilities when I was minister. A lot of things was carried out and managed by my husband, and I'm very grateful for that. So probably if you really want to be a leader, and, and a <laughs> leader, <laughs> you, you need to have a very supportive spouse who understands <laughs> this and who, who stand uh, beside you. I think that's interesting because at one point you had mentioned to me what internal factors got you through the hard times and what external factors. And, uh, and I was having an argument with my husband, so I was very taken when you <laughs> were talking about the, the support of yours. Um, but also, um, I wonder if you could come up with uh, just an example that would illustrate 
um, what your day was like. I mean, you, you, you mentioned to me, and I, I thought it was useful for maybe our audience to hear, um, how you went from avoiding just checking boxes all day um, and, and maybe just a little snippet of some scenario. I'm sure you can draw something must have happened that was hard. Give us one example of a hard day um, to give a flavor of, of what those incredible attributes you have are. Okay, the, the routine job in that office is signing papers, <laughs> meeting directors or deputy ministers, uh, going to the parliament for hearings, and that happened a lot, not only to me, to a number of ministries <laughs> always, um, answering media questions, dealing with things that you don't expect, uh, emergencies, especially related to conflict, related to secu security, suicide attacks, injuries. Uh, th this was especially uh, in, in the last two years when I was in the office, this, this happened a lot and it affected the entire work plan or the day, the, the, the calendar of the day, the activities of the day. Uh, for those of you who are coming from mus Muslim societies, you know that Eid is a big festive uh, in our part of the world. And it's three days. Um, first day of Eid, 9.30 in the morning, after the Eid prayers, I get the news that there was a suicide attack during Eid prayers in one of the provinces. And a lot of people were killed and injured, massive casualties. Hundreds of people were injured and killed. So. 1 p.m. I am in the, uh, in the, in the helicopter uh, organized by Ministry of Defense, um, mobilized few doctors and surgeons who were on call, went to the place, 6 p.m. we were there, uh, just hands-on, uh, real field work, uh, organizing a blood donation, a big blood donation campaign asking people to come and donate blood, helping uh, the emergency ward to do the triage, uh, calling for referral, organizing flights and helicopters, especially helicopters to take patients to another facility for major surgery, um, preparing the, the data, communication, and, and coordinating between different departments in the hospital, between the hospital and the governor office, and so on. And then the second day of the Eid is went by, the third day of the Eid went by, and I came third day of the Eid in the evening and to my family and I said, hello, Eid Mubarak, and which was <laughs> not, um, that was not easy, but that's how, that, that, that's where the commitment and dedication comes in. Or that's where you say, I'm responsible for this job and even one single life is important for us. So that's a great, example without being specific of the enormous chain of trade-offs you've made in your life. Um, you mentioned something to me that I'm going to prompt you to, to share with our group about what you, what you did every day to say to yourself that allowed you to maybe not sink into what we all sink into is the, the tasks we have on our list each day. And I wonder if you could share that. Um, uh, a few months later in that job, I realized that it's so easy to trap into day-to-day -day activities like signing papers. They are easy. They are really, they don't question you a lot <laughs> except reading them, making sure the process is followed and there are signatures of the previous, previous managers. Or just doing the easy things that really don't challenge you but you're comfortable doing them because you're used to it. You're, 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 uh, you're happy with this, with the pace, with the, with the activity, but then I realized at the end of the day, what is the result? What have you produced? Number of signatures you made on the paper? <laughs> Number of pe uh, interactions you had with the people? No, it's not. So I, I, I set um, a statement for myself. It's not from me, it's from others, but I, 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 I took it uh, for me and it says, do one thing that scares you. Do one thing every day that scares you. And I made a commitment to myself that I will do one day, one thing every day that scares me, that I normally don't do it, or I, I'm not very comfortable doing it, but they are important. 
they are important for decision making, they are important for that, for that job, they are important for the people. So I said, let's do that, let's face it. And that was very helpful for my functional outcome and for my uh, professional growth. I was so touched when you first told me that, and I think it, it does, um, it reminds us of all the attributes we talk about in leadership, one that we often don't mention explicitly, which I think you show, and I don't want to embarrass you, is courage. It's just, you know, courage to, to pursue something that's important and hard and uncharted. Um, now with that, uh, we only have a few minutes uh, to end, and, um, and I'm going to again prod you because I can do whatever I want since we're on camera and you can't <laughs> run away. Um, if I could ask you two questions, and so we don't have time for both, but I'll tell you what they are. It's uh, give me some good news and some bad news. You know, tell me what you're most worried about and then tell me something that we should be optimistic about. And I'm gonna fold that in because I'm gonna cheat and say, I don't want you to tell us what you're worried about because I think we all share in the public health community what some of the big worries are. But you are an undeniable beacon of optimism. And um, so two things, if you could uh, wrap up our, our last couple minutes. One is, when you look back at your time in the ministry, um, are there moments that struck you as, this is why I do this? This is why I do this. And I think a follow-up to that is, give us one reason to be optimistic. Okay. Um, in 2014, which was the last year uh, of me in the Ministry of Public Health as a minister, I had a busy day one day, and it was fall, so the days are short. And then my assistant came and said, there is two people wanted to see you, and they are not in, on my schedule, or they have not taken up an appointment. And I said, okay, they, I will see them probably at the end of the day. So the day went by, and it is around 6, 6 p.m. It's already dark, I mean dark outside. And then my assistant came and I was ready to go, and my assistant, a very tough day, very full, full day. And my assistant came and said, they want to come and see you, and they, they have been waiting for you. And I, 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 I welcomed them. It's a father and a daughter. The daughter is 18 years old, and the father is our staff. She came to see me and to tell me her story. She said that she, since her father is working in this ministry for so many years, she has been following this ministry. She has been connected to the ministry. She came to the child care center when she, she was a child. And, and she came on and off to her father's office. And she told me that she wants to become minister of health one day because she wants to follow my path. And I was so moved with that. A very young uh, girl, and I said, that's not enough. You should do more than that. You should set yourself to do more than that and to achieve more than that. You will become a minister. You will become probably a governor, a vice president, and the president of Afghanistan. That made my day. And no matter how hard the day was or how hard the whole time was, this five uh, year, in the ministry, when I could inspire a girl or a boy in any place in Afghanistan, when they saw me on television and they say, I can be one day like her. And I think, I was satisfied. I was very happy with that. Another time, uh, a, a man came from southeast part of Afghanistan to visit me. Again, not, not on the schedule, uh, um, but and anyway, I, I met him, and he was a traditional man from Southeast. Some of you who knows Afghanistan, you know what I mean, who came and asked me for her daughter to enroll in midwifery education program in their province. He was told in his province that it's not, it's not possible, they cannot do it, and so on. And they said, go to, the, to Kabul and get the authorization from there. And he came to me. Somehow it didn't work along the line for, with others. And he came to me and said, please, I want my daughter to be educated. That is transformation. That is 
when you create demand, that is when you create change. What, that, that, I, and I was very happy with that. Now, um, 10 seconds to tell uh, me exactly. one good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the young generation in Afghanistan have gone through a lot of transformation, especially in the last 15 years. We have a number of young leaders who are educated, who are committed to the cause, and that cause is development, prosperity, and peace for Afghanistan. We want to be helped. Please help Afghans to help themselves. With that message to that next generation, I warmly thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you.